Hello. Ooh, this works. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to say a few welcome words. I am so pleased to see that Wisconsin came out despite the April snows. Thank you all for being here. <laughs> um, I'm Maureen Ryan. I'm the deputy director of the Center for 21st Century Studies. And it is our pleasure to have Jen Kaufman here today. Um, I just want to give a few um, announcements about uh, the center C21, as we call it, um, around here. And then I will um, have uh, English professor Lane Hall give a little introduction, and then we'll have um, Dan's talk. So um, for many of you, this is kind of like not our usual venue. C21 is a research institute, uh, really a humanities research center at um, UWM. We've been around since 1968. Um, and we focus on critical public and digital humanities across the humanities, arts, and social sciences. So we're kind of trying to um, do all of those things in different ways with the programming that we have every year. So um, Jan Kaufman is obviously sort of a public um, historian, journalist figure. Um, some of our other events, this is kind of the end of our season because <laughs> it, it is spring. The semester is ending soon. Um, but I wanted to tell you about a couple of other things that we have coming up in case this is your kind of first time at a C21 event. Um, tomorrow, actually, this is not a C21 event per se, but we are helping to spread the word. Um, the Dean's Distinguished Lecture um, in the Humanities is being presented tomorrow by activist um, Winona LaDuke. And that is tomorrow at 6 in Merrill 131, so that's nearby on campus. Um, I believe there's a reception at 6 and the talk is at 6.30. Um, Leduc is an internationally renowned activist. She works on issues of sustainable development, renewable energy, um, and food systems. And so she um, will be presenting tomorrow on the next energy economy, grassroots strategies to mitigate global climate change and how we move ahead. That promises to be a really fabulous talk, so um, please join us for that again tomorrow if you can. Um, C21 also is welcoming Donna Haraway and Anna Singh next Wednesday, um, 3.30 to 5 p.m. in Curtin 175. And they'll be talking, actually, similarly to um, Winona LaDuke about the art of living and dying on a damaged planet. Um, so conversations about ecology and um, humans and non-humans and their interrelatedness. So that's next Wednesday the 17th. Um, and then finally, our last big event for the season is our spring conference. We have one every year, and they're kind of broad and interdisciplinary in scope. So this conference is on the theme of insecurity, which touches in a lot of ways on a lot of um, pressing issues of the day, labor being one of them, I think. We'll have some great panels on labor insecurity, climate, um, technology, other things. And that is May 2nd through 4th, also in Curtin Hall, which is... <coughs> I'm turned around. One building over. Um, so please, if you're interested in any of these events, we have all our information on our website. It's uwm.edu slash c21. Um, you can also find me. I dressed uh, very brightly today for your convenience. You can catch me afterwards. Um, so I will turn it over to Lane Hall. Please join us um, in welcoming Lane and Dan. <laughs> yeah, OK. Thank you, and uh, thank you for coming. Uh, for the, it's a nice crowd for the conditions. Um, uh, so I, I want to first acknowledge that here in Milwaukee, we stand on traditional Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, Menominee homeland along the southwest shores of the great Michigami, North America's largest system of freshwater lakes where the Milwaukee, Menominee, and Kinnikinnick rivers meet and the people of Wisconsin's sovereign Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations remain present. I'm also happy to welcome uh, you to this talk with author, journalist, and musician Dan Kaufman. His presentation tonight is titled The Fall of Wisconsin, The Legacy of Divide and Conquer Politics and the Aftermath of the 2018 Elections. 
Dan is the author of a recently published book, The Fall of Wisconsin, The Conservative Conquest of a Progressive Bastion and the Future of American Politics. It's kind of a long title, Dan. <laughs> I bet. Um, he's paid by the word. I, I, I first met Dan in uh, 2012 during vigils where we collectively mourned the horrendous mass slaying at the Sikh temple in Oak Creek, which he was covering at the time for the New Yorker. In the next few years, I would frequently see him at actions, events, and events at the state capitol where he would often be assigned to write feature stories for the New York Times, The Nation, The New Yorker, among many other fine publications. I especially remember talking with him during a particularly boisterous protest in 2015 when he interviewed union activist, friend, and iron worker Randy Bryce, who's here with us tonight, about the right to work bill that had been rammed through in the wee hours. Ah, such times those were. That night, it seemed like the Capitol building in, uh, might be occupied a second time as emotions were running high and angry crowds were beginning to gather. In spite of the intensity, uh, Dan's subsequent article for the New York Times Magazine impressed me with its clarity, accuracy, and thoughtful prose. It is no surprise that he went on to write such an informative, detailed, and significant book about these turbulent times in Wisconsin. Though he currently lives in Brooklyn, he grew up in Madison, so he understands the deep histories involved in our state politics, and he's been around for every major development in these political struggles. He also understands the importance of Wisconsin on our larger national developments, uh, as Jane Meyer, author of the book Dark Money, said about Dan's work, through the microcosm of one state, Dan Kaufman does a masterful job explaining what's happened to America and why. And so with that, I'm honored to now turn this over to Dan Kaufman for his insights about our great and troubled history. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is that mic okay? Great. Uh, well, let me explain the subtitle first. That was, uh, it was a little too long, uh, but it's what we wound up going with. Um, Lane, you might want to send an email to my editor about your, any suggestions you have. Maybe for the paperback, it could be changed. Um, but it's really nice to be back at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. I was here for one summer. My wife was getting a degree in dance. We really loved it, um, loved this city and fell in love with it. And I want to thank the Center for 21st Century Studies for bringing me here. Special thanks to Lane, Richard Grusin, and Maureen Ryan for making this talk happen. I'm, it's a real honor to be part of this fantastic, innovative programming that goes on here at the Center. And it's actually, frankly, reassuring to see such an institution flourishing at this university despite the many years of attacks on the University of Wisconsin system under Governor Scott Walker. Those attacks I took somewhat personally because of my father, Jerry, who was a professor of urban and regional planning in Madison for 30 years. Though he was a native of New York City, for me, my dad, my dad came to embody the Wisconsin idea, and especially its core ethical commandment that the expertise of the university's faculty should serve the state's citizens. My dad's contribution to that effort was through his pioneering study of food systems, work that helped expose how poverty and racism routinely deny millions of Americans access to healthy, affordable food. His food systems work led to his belief that urban agriculture could ameliorate this problem. And so he applied his research, helping to create Troy Gardens, a community garden in a working class neighborhood on Madison's north side, as well as serving as the president of Growing Power here in Milwaukee, where he helped implement programs that brought subsidized produce to needy families in this city and other places. I traveled to Growing Power's urban farm many times with my father, but I didn't really begin to understand Milwaukee, which is a city I came to love until I began reporting on Wisconsin's politics about eight years ago. Milwaukee's history is central to this book. As the title makes clear, the fall of Wisconsin traces the precipitous descent 
of the state's fortunes, which began in earnest in 2010 when a Tea Party wave elected Scott Walker as governor while also delivering both houses of the state legislature to Republicans. During their tenure, Walker and his legislative allies oversaw one of the largest declines of the middle class of any state in the country, a poverty rate that climbed to a 30-year high, roads that were routinely ranked among the worst in the country, the University of Wisconsin-Madison falling for the first time out of the rankings of the country's top five research, research schools, and the enactment of a voter ID law that, according to one study, deterred roughly 11% of the state's population from voting in the 2016 presidential election. But in order to give meaning to this fall, I also wanted to show what had come before. Historically, Wisconsin was a cradle to both the labor and environmental movements. Its progressive tradition was instrumental in creating workers' compensation, the progressive income tax, forest conservation, the Social Security Act, public employee unions, and even Medicare, whose principal architect was a Milwaukeean named Wilbur Cohen. Cohen was steeped in the Wisconsin idea, and especially its affinity for social insurance. Milwaukee's tradition of democratic socialism flourished in the early 20th century and was essential to the forging of Wisconsin's progressive identity. In 2010, after a corruption scandal Milwaukee had tarred both Republicans and Democrats, the socialists swept into power, winning 14 state legislative offices, the mayor's office, which they would hold off and on until 1960, and a congressional seat. The party's electoral victories in 1910 pushed the state's progressive Republicans, whose lodestar was the governor, senator, and later third-party presidential candidate fighting Bob La Follette. It pushed them to make bolder reforms to compete for voters. The only way to beat the socialists is to beat them to it, Charles McCarthy, one of La Follette's most essential allies, once wrote. I'm grateful to many people, some of whom are here tonight, for helping me understand this movement. In particular, I want to thank John Goethe, Milwaukee's unofficial historian laureate, and Ames McGinnis, a professor here at UWM, who were both incredibly generous with their time and knowledge. Discussing Milwaukee socialism here, of all places, is a little like bringing coal to Newcastle. But I wanted to do so to honor Anita Zeidler, a person who tragically is not here, and whose insight was crucial for me. Anita, who died suddenly on Labor Day last year of a heart disease, was a daughter of Frank Zeidler, Milwaukee's last socialist mayor. Her knowledge and memories gave me a direct window into the philosophy of Milwaukee socialism. And in this case, they also touched on a theme of the book and of this talk, the legacy of divide and conquer politics. You can see some of that divisiveness in a recent tweet by Mark Jefferson, the executive director of the Wisconsin Republican Party, who disparaged the state's biggest city after the Democratic Party chose Milwaukee as the site of its convention next summer. No city in America has stronger ties to socialism than Milwaukee, Jefferson wrote. And with the rise of Bernie Sanders and the embrace of socialism by its newest leaders, the American left has come full circle. It's only fitting the Democrats would come to Milwaukee. Jefferson then went on to say that the people of Wisconsin are far too practical to embrace socialism. Jefferson did not seem terribly versed in the history of Milwaukee socialism, which I would argue was marked by a kind of idealistic pragmatism. I would recommend that he pick up a copy of the memoirs of Emile Seidel, the city's first socialist mayor, which includes a passage that captures the movement's idealistic pragmatism better than anything else ever written. Some Eastern smarties called ours a sewer socialism, wrote Seidel, who was a woodcarver by trade. He went on, yes, we wanted sewers in the workers' homes, but we wanted much, oh so very much more than sewers. We wanted our workers to have pure air. We wanted them to have sunshine. We wanted planned homes. We wanted living wages. We wanted recreation for young and old. We wanted vocational education. We wanted a chance for every human being to be strong and live a life of happiness. And we wanted everything that was necessary to give them that. Playgrounds, parks, lakes, beaches, clean creeks and rivers, swimming and wading pools, Social centers, reading rooms, clean fun, music, dance, song, and joy for all. That was our Milwaukee social democratic movement. Seidel's humanism was made more tangible for me through Anita's memories of her father. Anita described how central empathy was to Frank's political vision. That empathy, she said, was forged when her father was 13 years old. 
He learned about poverty then, Anita told me. Frank came from a modest family. His father was a barber. And so he took a job bringing leftover newspapers collected during the week to widowed single women. Many of these women lived in basement apartments, mother-in-law flats, Anita called them, that had dirt floors. The newspapers Frank, Frank brought once a week were meant to cover these floors. Sometimes Frank would also take food packages to these women. The memory of their poverty, Anita said, stayed with Frank forever. Frank's journey to socialism began in the Depression when he developed rheumatic fever and was bedridden for a year. He devoted himself to reading, history, politics, literature. One of his sons even claimed he read every book in the local branch library. He was particularly taken with Eugene Debs and Norman Thomas, whose writings contributed to his decision to join the Socialist Party in 1932. He later recounted his reasons for becoming a socialist methodically. One was the brotherhood of people all over the world. Another was its struggle for peace. Another was the equal distribution of economic goods. Another was the idea of cooperation. A fifth was the idea of democratic planning in order to achieve your goals. In 1948, after an eight-year lull, Milwaukee socialists had a swan song electing their last mayor, Frank Seidel, who had worked as a county surveyor. His unlikely victory was aided by the reputation of his handsome, golden-voiced brother, Carl, who often broke into song while campaigning. That talent helped Carl upset the city's longtime socialist mayor, Daniel Hone, in 1940. But two years later, Carl volunteered for service in the Navy Reserve and was killed when a German U-boat attacked his ship off the coast of South Africa, making him a national hero. Frank Seidler, who had backed Hone in that election, benefited from public sympathy for his brother. But he also won on the strength of his reputation for integrity. Though he was attacked by both the liberal Milwaukee Journal and the conservative Milwaukee Sentinel, Seidler benefited from a calm, deliberative style, an agenda devoted to strengthening schools, libraries, and public housing, and a humanizing image of him walking with his wife and six children on the street that, went, that was published in the Milwaukee Journal. He managed to beat a crowded field in the nonpartisan primary and then a mainstream liberal Democrat in the runoff. Zeidler proved to be an effective mayor, continuing the tradition of clean socialist municipal government. In 1952, the business magazine Fortune ran a series on the best-run American cities and, and ranked Milwaukee second in the country. Zeidler won re-election that year. But Zeidler's devotion to public housing exposed the rising racial anxiety among white Milwaukeeans as African Americans from the South began arriving in greater numbers. In 1955, Zeidler was photographed inaugurating inaugurating, in addition to Hillside Terrace, a public housing unit built a few years earlier. He pointedly handed the first sets of keys to two families, an African-American one and a white one. My dad insisted it be integrated, Anita told me. That was the end of affordable housing. It was also a flashpoint to see the destructive power of divide and conquer politics, especially when race is involved. One of Zeidler's primary antagonists was the real estate industry which stoked white flight by blockbusting. An agent would spread rumors that an African-American family would be moving in to get property owners to sell at a low price and then turn around and sell that same house at a higher price to an African-American family. As the historian Tula Connell describes in her excellent book, Conservative Counter-Revolution, the Milwaukee mayoral election of 1956 turned particularly nasty. Damaging rumors circulated widely that Zeidler was using city funds to pay for billboards in the South, urging African Americans to settle in Milwaukee. While Zeidler's opponent, an alderman, an alderman named Milton McGuire, denied involvement in circulating these rumors, he actively appealed to racial fears. Milwaukee needs an honest white, mayor for, white man for mayor was one of McGuire's slogans. In the aftermath of Zeidler's victory, Anita described the death threats her family received. We had a patrolman guarding the front and back of the house, she told me. We went to the FBI, but they wouldn't do anything about it. My dad got a lot of ugly phone calls and ugly mail. From then on, the rumors and nastiness got worse. Those, th those threats convinced Seidler not to seek another term. Seidler remained in his Northside apartment until his death at 93 in 2006. Nothing, not having to barricade his door with a sawhorse or spend the night on the floor as bullets sailed through a neighbor's house during a riot, could persuade him to leave his beloved neighborhood or betray his egalitarian ideals. Anita, who lived in that same duplex on the north side until she too died, 
told me how her father always remained absolutely true to his values. He welcomed any citizen to the city, she said. He believed every person has equal rights and equal responsibilities. So I, this is my first foray. And that was the first part of this talk. And now we're going to get to the audio visual. These, this is amazing, right? Pictures and everything. This was not the protest at Act 10. This was at the right to work fight, as Lane described. Um, and these photographs were taken by a friend and colleague of mine named Philip Montgomery, who uh, documented uh, my articles in two cases. One, this article about right to work in the New York Times Magazine, and a more recent piece about the Foxconn development in Mount Pleasant. But um, I'll just put, go through a couple of these quickly and then get to the next part. This was outside the Capitol during that fight. It was very, very cold, as some of you might remember. Um, and there is Randy Bryce and some of his colleagues on a job site when Randy was organizing against the right to work bill. Um, so uh, so-called right to work laws embody uh, divide and conquer politics, proving able to corrode labor's strength from the inside. Right to work laws eliminate the requirement for workers in a unionized workplace to pay dues, but not the union's obligation to provide services to non-dues paying employees. The more workers opt out, the thinner a union has to stretch its funds. Limited funds and fewer members diminish a union's capacity to negotiate for better wages and benefits, which in turn fuels the desire of more and more members to stop paying dues. On top of that, right to work foments resentment when dues-paying members and non-dues-paying members are working side by side. But understanding the racist origins of the right to work movement adds another dimension to their divisiveness. The right to work movement began in the early 1940s when unionization was exploding and even the South threatened to become heavily unionized. An editorial published that year in the Dallas Morning News sketched out the concept. It was then taken up by a Houston political activist named Vance Muse who led an organization called the Christian American Association. Muse was an avowed racist who told the United States Senate Committee in 1936, I am a Southerner and for white supremacy. He held a special animus towards unions because he believed they fostered race mixing. In Southern Exposure, a 1946 book about racism in the South, the muckraking journalist Stetson Kennedy quoted Muse's pitch on the need for right to work in which he said, white women and white men will be forced into organizations with black African apes whom they will have to call brother or lose their jobs. But Muse was also an effective fundraiser. He received support from General Motors and the DuPont family, among others, and he was an effective lobbyist. In 1944, the Christian American Association sponsored the amendment that made Arkansas one of the country's first right-to-work states. By 1947, 10 more states, most of them in the South, had become right to work. That same year, over President Harry Truman's veto, Congress passed the Taft-Hartley Act, which included a clause granting states the power to become right to work. Muse died in 1950, but his campaign had already been taken over by more mainstream opponents of labor. In 1955, Fred Hartley, the former congressman from New Jersey who helped draft Taft-Hartley, founded the National Right to Work Committee. Three years later, Kansas legislators, with the enthusiastic support of the oil magnate Fred Koch, David and Charles Koch's father, adopted a right to work amendment in their state. Muse was right to fear the ability of labor unions to foster transracial solidarity. Elements of the labor and civil rights movements began a close alliance during the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955 when the, when the United Auto Workers, which supported the boycott, paid the defendant's bail and court costs and its founder, Walter Ruther grew to be one of Martin Luther King's most loyal and devoted supporters. Interestingly, the law prohibiting conspiracies that was used to charge Rosa Parks, King, and 87 other Africans, African Americans who voluntarily turned themselves into the authorities had originally been written to break Alabama's trade unions. In the years that followed, King became a central figure in this alliance, arguing that the fates of the civil rights and labor movements were deeply connected their, su their success dependent on each other. In a 1961 letter to the Amalgamated Laundry Workers, a New York union, King wrote, 
As I have said many times and believe with all my heart, the coalition that can have the greatest impact in the struggle for human dignity here in America is that of the Negro and that of the forces of labor because their fortunes are so closely intertwined. King saw divide and conquer at the heart of the racism, poverty, and brutal labor conditions that flourished most acutely in the de-unionized South. In a 1965 speech in Montgomery, Alabama, he told the audience that wealthy landowners had created Jim Crow to destroy the burgeoning populist movement, which posed a threat to their power. You see, it was a simple thing to keep the poor white masses working for near starvation wages in the years that followed the Civil War, King said. Why, if the poor white plantation or mill worker became dissatisfied with his low wages, the plantation or mill owner would merely threaten to fire him and hire former Negro slaves and pay him even less. To thwart the threat of class-based appeals, the, pl the planters criminalized the ability of blacks and whites to come together as equals. It may be said of the Reconstruction era that the Southern aristocracy took the world and gave the poor white man Jim Crow, King said. And when his wrinkled stomach cried out for the food that his empty pockets could not provide, he ate Jim Crow, a psychological bird that told him that no matter how bad off he was, at least he was a white man, better than the black man. King put his ideas into action during his last effort before he was assassinated, supporting the 1968 Memphis sanitation workers' strike. The walkout became central to King's Poor People's Campaign, which he had launched a year earlier in the hope of uniting impoverished Americans of all races. The indifference of Memphis officials to the deaths of two black sanitation workers, Echo Cole and Robert Walker, who were crushed by a malfunctioning gar garbage truck compactor, had sparked the strike. But its origins lay in decades of mal maltreatment. Two weeks after their death, 1,300 Memphis sanitation workers refused to go to work. They sought an end to poverty wages. 40% of the workforce qualified for welfare and recognition for their union, which the city refused to accept. The Sanitation Workers Union, Local 1733, was an affiliate of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Workers, AFSCME, which had been founded more than three decades earlier in Madison out of fear that Roosevelt Democrats might turn Wisconsin's transparent civil ser service system into a patronage one. Having succeeded in safeguarding the civil service rules, AFSCME had grown as the Wisconsin legislature re recognized its right to represent municipal workers and later state workers, and it had gained widespread power across the country. Its support of Local 1733, hesitant at first, then full-throated, was crucial to sustaining the Memphis strike. Nonetheless, by mid-March of 1968, the strike was faltering until, until King revived it with his support. In his last speech, the night before he was king, killed, King outlined his hope that divide and conquer might yet be overcome. You know, whenever Pharaoh wanted to prolong the period of slavery in Egypt, he had a favorite, favorite formula for doing it, King told the striking workers. What was that? He kept the slaves fighting among themselves. But whenever the slaves get together, something happens in Pharaoh's court, and he cannot hold the slaves in slavery. As I am sure many here remember, two weeks after Scott Walker was sworn in, a billionaire donor to Walker's campaign named Diane Hendricks asked the new governor if there was any chance we'll ever get to be a completely red state and work on these unions. Walker assured her that Wisconsin would change. Hendricks then asked if Wisconsin would ever become a right-to-work state. Walker responded enthusiastically. The first step is we're going to deal with collective bargaining for all public employee unions, he said, because you use divide and conquer. Brad Lichtenstein, a documentary filmmaker who may be here, uh, is responsible for that footage. Brad captured a remarkable moment of candor in Amer American politics that I and many other journalists are eternally grateful to him for. Walker went on to do exactly what he had told Hendricks he would do. Though Walker had long supported right to work, he did not push the measure after he was elected governor in 2010. Even when he was attacking public unions in what became called Act 10, Walker consistently praised private sector unions, particularly those in the construction trades, calling them my partners in economic development. In 2012, before his recall election, he continued to publicly oppose right to work. I have no interest in a right to work law in this state. We're not going to pursue that in the remainder of our term, and we're not going to pursue it in the future. 
He won that race with the help of a third of the state's union households. Terry McGowan, the head of Operating Engineers 139, was one of those supporters. His union of some 7,000 workers endorsed Walker twice, in 2010 and 2014. When Walker's Divide and Conquer video was released in 2012, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel asked McGowan about the governor's remarks. McGowan told a reporter that the phrase divide and conquer troubled him. It means turning worker against worker, he said. Nonetheless, in 2014, McGowan met with Walker, who was seeking a contribution and another endorsement for governor at a small campaign office in Wauwatosa. I looked across the table at him and I said, we are both God-fearing men, McGowan told me. If you can tell me that right to work will not come on your desk, then I will take you for your word. He looked me in the eyes and he said, it will not make it to my desk. He was looking for a contribution and I was looking for a commitment. We both got what we came for. He kept his and I lost mine. Now, sorry, technical problem. I've, this is the rest of my talk. So. Uh, this now maybe is a good time to look at another picture. With the very high tech. This is at the hearing for the right to work bill. Uh, you can see hundreds of people trying to get in. Randy was one of them and I documented Randy's efforts which wound up uh, his speech. He was not allowed in. Uh, the um, Republican legislators barred the doors at a certain point. Um, and he gave his testimony outside in the hall in a very dramatic way. Um, so now I'll talk a little bit about Randy, uh, who is here, and it's really nice that he is here. Uh, he saw, Randy Bryce saw things differently than Terry McGowan. He had participated in the protest against Act 10 and then led a spirited effort against the right to work bill. A lot of guys in our local didn't see Act 10 as being important for iron workers, Bryce told me because it targeted public employees. I would ask them, how can you say there are good unions and bad unions? It's an idea that they're trying to kill. It's not the union itself. This is the strategy they're using to do it. They're splitting everything up. They're going after them first, then it's going to be somebody else. Then they're going to get to us too. Despite his promise, Walker of course did get to the building trades too. Divide and conquer has been remarkably effective in Wisconsin. Union membership has declined by 40% since the passage of Act 10. Now, a mere 8% of the workforce in Wisconsin is unionized, roughly the same percentage as Alabama, one of Vance Muse's first conquests. And, at least in 2016, Walker fulfilled his promise to Diane Hendricks when Wisconsin went for Donald Trump, the first time the state voted for a Republican president in more than 30 years. In April of 2017, I went with Randy Bryce to hear Donald Trump give a speech in Washington to the National Conference of the Building and Construction Trades. The parallel between Trump and Walker's efforts, despite their different temperaments, could not have been clearer. In 2016, Trump had railed against NAFTA and the TPP and done even better than Walker had done with union households. In fact, he did nearly as well as Ronald Reagan. Hillary Clinton won only 8% more union households than Trump compared with Barack Obama's 18% margin over Mitt Romney. By the time of his appearance before the building trades gathering, Trump had already betrayed the working class voters he was trying to woo. A few months earlier, he had tweeted a series of attacks against Chuck Jones, the president of a steelworkers local in Indiana. Those tweets resulted in violent threats against Jones from rabid Trump supporters. None of that, of course, hindered Trump from making his pitch. You're very talented people, Trump said. It's time we give you the level playing field you deserve. During the speech, Bryce began to inch past me and under his breath to himself said suckers as he exited. One of my first acts as president was to stop one of the great sellouts of the American worker, Trump continued. I immediately withdrew the United States from the disaster. This would have been a disaster. This would have been another NAFTA, which by the way is a disaster. I took you out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The crowd applauded loudly. Trump said he would approve the Keystone XL pipeline, which was met with bigger applause. He said he would use American steel, and then said it would be American steel made in America, which received a standing ovation. Sitting at a restaurant with Bryce after the talk, Trump's motorcade drove by, angrily reminding Bryce of what he had just walked out of. 
Trump successfully dividing the labor movement. I can't believe that guys actually think he's going to do something for us, Bryce said. Even if he would, just the cost of all the people he's going after. Even if I had a job working on infrastructure, if I was driving home from work, going through my neighborhood and knowing there are people afraid to go outside because the same person that helped me get a job wants to break up their family and send them across the border, that's not worth it. It was all too familiar to Bryce. We're the in kids, he said. He's trying to get our group, but these other people, he said, gesturing with a sweep of his hand, they're not worthy. One of the people I talked to about Divide and Conquer from my book was Kathy Kramer, the UW political scientist who wrote The Politics of Resentment, a superb account of the political sentiments felt by rural Wisconsinites, which caught fire nationally after Trump's Wisconsin victory. Kramer told me how she saw resentment intensify during the Act 10 protests. Who are these people with all the time on their hands that they can protest during the day? Was a common complaint she heard. They saw the protests as an unruly, violent mob defacing the Capitol, she said, an idea that was stoked incessantly by conservative media. Yet despite the passage of Act 10, Kramer told me that her subjects were unsatisfied. They are still angry, she said, less angry than in the moment it happened. But it's not like they feel that public employees are now on the same playing field. They still feel that public employees are getting too much because they think they complain too much. Kramer's fieldwork gels with the findings of a 2005 study published in the Australian Journal of Psychology that showed that resentment persisted even after the object of the resentment was cut down. In other words, taking something, higher wages, benefits, away from someone else, won't make you feel better about not having those things. The people Kramer interviewed for the politics of resentment made no mention of the conservative organizations, billionaire donors, and corporations that have been writing many of the policies depressing the living standards of working class people in rural and urban America alike. In her book, Kramer does not ad address the origins of rural resentment, whether it came from within the people themselves or whether it was fomented by leaders like Walker and Trump and reverberates more forcefully because of economic insecurity. In her office, though, she suggested it might be a combination of both. A lot of the sentiments that Walker tapped into were there the first moment I met these groups in 2007, she said. And yet, like with any human relationship, when you're with a pal and they give a name to a concern you have, then it catalyzes it. It makes it easier for you to recall it, to think about it when it's labeled and packaged for you. You may have felt that way for a good long time, but now it's more accessible. Yet some of the things Kramer found people angry about seemed to have no clear precedent. I went into my fieldwork asking about immigration because I thought it often brings up issues of social class, which is what I was interested in, she said. But it never came up. I think we see, I think we see the sanctioning much more clearly after the election. She mentioned a post-election incident at a girls' high school soccer match in Elkhorn, a small town in southwestern Wisconsin, southeastern Wisconsin. The Elkhorn and Beloit Memorial varsity teams were in the middle of a match when a small group of Elkhorn fans began shouting racist chants. Donald Trump, build that wall, they yelled at Beloit's Latina and African American players, along with racial epithets. The Beloit girls, too distraught to continue, walked off the field. One of the girls was cradled in the arms of one of our assistants for a good 15 to 20 minutes, the Beloit soccer coach told a reporter after the game. He believed the girls on, the, on his team would be scarred by the experience. He knew he had been. Seeing the impact on those kids is something I will never forget, he said. I asked Kramer what she thought the legacy of divide and conquer politics would be. It's profound, she said, shaking her head. How do you turn that around? The kinds of people who care about what has happened have already taken sides for life. They know who the enemies are. How do you turn that around short of a world war or a Great Depression. What I'm parsing through these days is the enormous sense of loss. Is it that my state has actually changed? Or is it that my sense of the state has changed? It was always understood that Wisconsin was a great place to live, and people were decent to one another. I went away to graduate school, and I was always proud to be from this place where people were so nice to one another. As I matured and as I wrote this book, I wondered, are we so nice to one another? And have we always been? Kramer rattled off some of the uglier moments in the state's recent past. The fight over Native American treaty rights, an outburst of anti-Semitism in her hometown of Grafton when she was growing up. What I don't know is the legacy that Walker has left, 
What is it? She went on. Part of my struggle is now is the question of whether we really have democracy. I believe that there's a role for ordinary people to do something about what's happening. I'm hoping so. I think so. If that's the case, what do we do? How do we ensure that we have leaders who stand on flatbeds and say, hold on, do not go at each other's throats because there's a better part of us here, as opposed to, you're right. She pointed in the air towards an imaginary enemy. They're the ones. During the campaign for Walker's third term, divide and conquer politics appeared to exhaust itself. There's no question that Walker had found himself less able to divert attention from Wisconsin's deteriorating public infrastructure. Potholes had become widely known as Scott Holes, while some communities, like Northfield, a small town in the west central part of the state, stripped the asphalt off of miles of roads and returned it to gravel after they found themselves unable to pay for resurfacing. Public education had continued to buckle under the strain of Walker's cuts. Between 2011 and 2017, Walker had slashed more than a billion dollars in spending on schools and the state's university system. And since the passage of Act 10, Wisconsin's public high school graduation rate dropped from a tie for second best nationwide to a tie for ninth. School districts, particularly rural ones, became increasingly reliant on passing referendums to increase property taxes just to keep their schools open. Sometimes residents re rejected these referendums and schools closed. The closure of the elementary school in Darien, a small farming town near the Illinois border, resonated widely. Walker had grown up a few miles away and had gone to school in the same district. Given how Walker had abandoned Wisconsin schools, Tony Evers, a lifelong educator, became the perfect foil for the two-term governor. A mild-mannered former small town science teacher and high school principal, Evers was elected state superintendent in 2009 and attended protests against Act 10. A good portion of his job as superintendent had been dealing with the continuing fallout from the law. People are leaving the teaching profession and fewer people are coming in, he told me. Those things are Act 10 related. Evers called for a transformational budget for public education that included an increase of $600 million for special education and full funding for universal pre-K. No more false choices, he said. Evers ran as a temperate educator who wanted to return the state to the less divisive political climate of the pre-Walker era. My goal as a governor isn't to be the next Bob LaFollette, he told me. Yet Evers has a strong, if understated, feeling for Wisconsin's progressive tradition. When he was a boy growing up in Plymouth, Wisconsin, his father, Raymond, was the resident physician at Rocky Knoll, the state sanitarium that treated many of the Kohler workers ravaged by a disease called silicosis, which made it difficult to breathe. Evers remembers his father testifying on behalf of the sick men so they could receive unemployment benefits or workers' compensation. It was about social justice, Evers told me. He was on call 24 hours a day. He saw every patient every single day. He could have gone into private practice, but he didn't. He decided to be a county employee and work with people who struggled. I learned a lot from watching that. Wisconsin has played a pioneering role in education. In 1856, a German immigrant named Margaret Meyer Schertz established the first kindergarten in the United States in a little white clapboard house in Watertown, Wisconsin. Schertz's school lasted only a couple of years in Watertown, but the kindergarten movement spread. In 1882, Milwaukee became one of the first large American cities to offer free kindergarten as part of a public education. Evers talked to me about Schertz's kindergarten and Wisconsin's historic commitment to education. He considers himself a defender of this heritage and saw his path to victory in reclaiming the transpartisan pragmatism that once defined Wisconsin politics. You don't have to be a historian to remember that progressivism wasn't necessarily democratic or republican, he told me. The progressive tradition was about protecting natural resources and support for our schools and university, and those things are under attack. But it wasn't just Democrats that held those progressive values. They were held by the people of Wisconsin. That's where we have to be. For many of the state's progressives, Evers' faith in the electorate was borne out by the stunning results of the midterms. Tony Evers had won on explicit campaign promises to end public austerity, restore environmental protections, improve health care, and reestablish government transparency. But it wasn't just the governor's race. Democrats swept all statewide offices. Josh Call, a former US attorney, defeated the incumbent attorney general, Brad Schimmel. And Mandela Barnes, the 
the son of the UAW retiree Jesse Barnes, one of the stars of the fall of Wisconsin, was elected lieutenant governor, only the second African-American elected to statewide office in Wisconsin's history. But the Democratic victories on election day only fueled Republican intransigence. Less than a day had passed before the Republican Speaker of the House, Robin Voss, suggested to reporters that the legislature, which remained in Republican control, might strip the governorship of some of its power. The idea, like so many Republican policies adopted in the state over the pre preceding eight years, didn't originate in Wisconsin. It had first been used in North Carolina in 2016 when Roy Cooper, a Democrat, broke up unified Republican control of state government by winning the governorship. The Republican effort went so far that at the beginning of the next legislative session, when a reporter asked Phil Berger, the, state pres the Senate president pro tempore, if Republicans plan to take away any more of Governor Cooper's powers, Berger joked, does he still have any? In Wisconsin, Republican put for Republicans put forward several bills that would take away certain powers from the governor and attorney general's office and give them to the legislature. Drafted in secret, the legislation was allowed a single public hearing. Democratic legislators and outraged citizens scrambled to parse more than 40 serious changes to state law embedded in the proposals. In a now familiar pattern, Voss and his counterpart in the Senate, Majority Leader Scott Fitzgerald, wanted to vote on the bills within days of their release, and Walker soon indicated an openness to signing such legislation. Fortified by the Republicans' gerrymandered advantage, Voss was notably defiant. There's no doubt about it that the voters across Wisconsin affirmed our record, the record of our party, and the agenda that we have put forward over the past eight years, he told the Assembly Republican Caucus a few days after the election. We are the ones that were given a mandate to govern. On the Monday that the Republican bills were given their public hearing by the Joint Finance Committee, aggrieved citizens from across the state descended upon the Capitol, eager to testify. They quoted John Locke and George Washington, and they registered, and they registered 1,426 to 1 in opposition to the lame duck legislation. Similar scenes had played out many times over the past eight years. One middle-aged woman from Oconomowoc, a small town in conservative Waukesha County, made a particularly strong impression. She kept saying to the legislators, look at us, look at us, Chris Taylor, a Democratic Assemblywoman from Madison remembered. When the woman saw Senator Howard Markline, a Republican, staring into his phone as she spoke, she repeated her demand. And you know what he did, Taylor said? He looked up at her, smiled, and then looked back down at his phone. The legislature was scheduled to vote on the proposals the day after the hearing. Inside the Senate chambers, Republican legislators raced to confirm more than 80 appointments to state agencies. Many of the appointees had not had a single public hearing or been vetted for financial conflicts of interest. Some of these appointments would last until 2023, after the end of Evers' term, and some were to powerful state institutions such as the University of Wisconsin's Board of Regents. No one was really bothering to hide the purpose of this lame duck legislation anymore, to continue the Republicans' hold on state government, even at the expense of fundamental democratic principles like respect for majority rule and the separation of powers. Wisconsin had once again been transformed into a national proxy, the latest, most disturbing iteration of the rise of minority rule. But after eight years of relentless attacks on Wisconsin's progressive political traditions, the state's government had already been transformed into something that was hard to recognize as a democracy. The lame duck legislation had only made it harder. Like the Wisconsin Republican Party's successful effort to gut the state's campaign finance laws, decimate the labor movement, and weaken voting rights, seizing powers from the state's newly elected governor and attorney general promised to further the party's most enduring achievement, engineering its own dominance. The lame duck bills were a kind of dystopian bookend to Act 10, and they offered proof, if any more was needed, that the transformation of, of Wisconsin went deeper than any single election cycle could remedy. Still, Tony Evers would not be helpless. Wisconsin's governor wields one of the most powerful veto pens in the country. The fight for Wisconsin's political soul would continue, and the state is certain to remain at the center of national politics in 2020 and beyond, just as the battle over the lame duck bills continue in the courts. Curiously, Evers did not hold his inaugural event in its traditional place near the bust of Bob La Follette. I had passed by that bust during the lame duck vote 
and it had seemed somehow larger than I remembered. Perhaps that was because La Follette's message had become a well, as well suited to this age as to his own. One could hear echoes of his indignation in a new generation of progressive politicians raging against economic injustice and the threat that concentrated wealth poses to American democracy. The supreme issue involving all the others is the encroachment of the powerful few upon the rights of the many, La Follette wrote in 1913. It was Wisconsin's own citizens who embodied most clearly the connection between past and present. There is an unending struggle to make and keep government representative, La Follette said in a speech a year before he died. Mere passive citizenship is not enough. His progressive descendants had honored those words. And though they had won only a stalemate in their battle to restore La Follette's ideals to Wisconsin, their spirited defeats had echoed across the country. An early warning to Americans that the country's politics were drifting dangerously far from their moorings. More than that, the citizens' tenacity had overcome divide and conquer, turning at last monumental defeats into a victory that bore out the words of Fighting Bob. America is not made, but is in the making. And yet, a mere six months later, conservative Republicans would be in celebrating their resilience yet again with the election of Bruce, help me pronounce his name, how is it? Bruce Hagedorn. Hagedorn? Hagedorn. Hagedorn. Hagedorn to the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Thank you. With enormous support from Wisconsin Family Action, a Christian right organization, and a flood of dark money pouring in from Americans for Prosperity, the Koch brothers' political arm at the end of the race. Hagedorn squeezed out a narrow victory of less than 6,000 votes over his opponent, Lisa Neubauer. It hadn't seemed to matter that he had compared homosexuality to bestiality or that he had been abandoned by some traditional Republican donors. Perhaps that abandonment helped fuel the passion of his face. Coupled with the tepid campaign Neubauer ran, which was reminiscent of Russ Feingold's campaign against Ron Johnson in 2016, he had proved once again the resilience and tenacity of the conservative right who will now control Wisconsin Supreme Court for years to come, potentially thwarting the Democrats' chances to break the lock on power Republicans have held in the state legislature since their 2011 gerrymandering. After his victory, I remembered something Dale Schultz, a former Republican state senator, had told me years ago. Schultz was a moderate who voted against Act 10, among other priorities of his party. For that, he was ostr ostr ostracized by his fellow Republicans and challenged in a primary. Schultz retired in 2015, exhausted and estranged by his party's orthodoxy. After he retired, he told me about a Republican caucus meeting he attended several years ago with a prominent conservative lobbyist, which in his view illuminated the commitment the Republicans had to uproot, to uproot Wisconsin's progressive past entirely. All we need is 50% of the vote plus one, the lobbyist told Schultz and his colleagues. If we get any more than that one vote, then we didn't push the state far enough in the direction we want to push it because we had votes to spare. And if we lose an election, we'll win it back and then we'll start up where we left off. Thank you, and I'd be more than happy to take any questions you have. I think there's still time, thank you. Yes? Of the uprising of teachers unions across the country. Well, I think it's, it's amazing, and I think it probably does maybe, um, at least at a subconscious level, reflect um, some of the failures of... Oh, the question was, what do I make of the teachers' uprisings across the country? Uh, they're happening now, West Virginia, Oklahoma, other places, uh, Los Angeles. Um, I think it's amazing, and um, I do think that, you know, sometimes these defeats, like what happened in Act 10, can echo in interesting ways, and I'm sure that at least to a lot of people, it was clear that something more would probably have to be done in order to uh, enact a change. And, and, um, and I think that um, it's interesting. As labor is at its weakest moment in terms of numbers, there's, it seems like paradoxical, but maybe it's not. It's, there's the most interest in labor among young people and across the country because Finally, people are figuring out that the decline of our 
living standards is due to the massive decline of the labor movement. So, any other questions? Yes. So Wisconsin seems like kind of a microcosm for what's going on in America. And we're seeing a really stark divide between urban and rural communities. And I'm wondering if you could speak about that, the difference between urban Wisconsin and rural Wisconsin. Yeah, great question. And a lot of my book, there's like a whole chapter about, of my book kind of related to this question. And one of the most interesting thinkers around this issue was Aldo Leopold, the greatest, one of the greatest Wisconsinites, who kind of in the 40s actually saw the um, possibility of the depletion of rural economic life because of corporate agriculture and this idea of always pursuing bigger and bigger yields. And that has been borne out. Um, in the late 1940s, there were 150,000 dairy farms in Wisconsin. Now there's fewer than 9,000. And yet the state produces more milk than it did then. So if you go into a lot of these small towns, there's a tremendous hollowing out, not unlike you know, I've been reporting another story in Youngstown, Ohio for the past couple of months. And although the scale is different, this, this hollowed outness is very similar. And there's very few businesses. The last scene of my book takes place in a little town called South Wayne. And I think the part of Kathy Kramer, and I loved Kathy Kramer's book, but I, I don't know if there's enough emphasis on like, the context of economic insecurity, which can affect people in different ways and can make the possibility for this kind of divisive politics much more possible. Um, and I think that that is what has been happening for decades in rural America. It's been hollowed out and hollowed out, as it has in Rust Belt communities like Youngstown. So people are angry, and that anger gets directed in different ways. And if there isn't a credible and strong counter message that the louder side that is pointing to somebody else for creating these problems is going to have a very receptive audience. Yes, Roger. Yeah. I was just uh, struck by your talking about the significance of the, the right to work movement because there was uh, a way that the segregationist movement coincided with the interests of industrialists who wanted to avoid unions and the segregationists who wanted to avoid what they called race mixing. And I think one of the things that, that's really fascinating is how the South has really dragged down living standards across the country by spreading the, the divide and conquer mentality behind right to work and also, the, the South really began the war between the states in terms of massive incentives to employers. And so, in a way, Wisconsin and the whole nation have been affected by that. I, I agree with that completely. And it is a race to the bottom. And the South was kind of like before NAFTA was a kind of version of that where companies would threaten to move down there where there weren't unions for lower wages. I mean, that is the point of these free trade agreements. There are no environmental regulations, meaningful ones, and it's cheap labor. Just now, I've been working on a piece about this GM plant closing in Lordstown, and they've unallocated the plant. It's been there since 1953. It's really the last bastion of decent paying jobs in the whole Mahoning Valley, which used to have 80,000 good steel paying jobs. But um, there's, very, there's only seven states with GM plants anymore. There's, there's, it's just been um, incredibly hollowed out. And they're building blazers in Mexico where they're paying people $3 an hour. And it, it's, it's obvious that a politician like Trump could capitalize on this. And again, especially when there isn't a very strong and cohesive counter message. So, yeah. Do you have any observations on the way out of this mess? <laughs> well, uh, well, I do think the restoration if, if, uh, of the labor movement would be very beneficial. Um, that is a really key aspect. And people wonder, I mean, because it does more than just raise wages and benefits. It's, it's a form of cohesion in society. And like, if you go to GM, local 1112 in Lordstown, they do everything. I mean, they, they have fundraiser drives for autistic children. I mean, it's, it's, it's the glue that's left in a very impoverished pocket of America. 
and now these people are, and there's no equivalent to that kind of job, 30 bucks an hour plus a pension uh, after 30 years. And so, I mean, I think this atomization is a real problem, and unions were a way that they diminished that, you know, because you could share ideas about stuff and also do stuff together. I mean, they're, they're, they're incredibly effective organizing. So, I mean, that's one thing. I mean, I think there, you know, it's, it's both a very dark time, but also, like, there's a lot of um, maybe openness to ideas that have been pushed aside for a long time, you know. And I think Wisconsin uprising was very important in 2011 because you hadn't had a significant labor action, like, on that scale in, in a long time. And even though it was defeated, again, it echoes out in different ways. And I think the Sanders campaign and other ideas, which is really like the return to this idea of public investment that was so prominent during the New Deal era and its aftermath, even under Republican presidents. But this, um, and the, the dearth of public investment has also become a bipartisan thing too as well. Democrats were responsible for it as well. So I think those two things, reviving the labor movement and much more public investment in, in everything. I mean, there's nothing compared to most other countries in the Western world, and even in compared to in America's past. Yes. Hi, um, I moved to Wisconsin. I've moved here. I've lived here for 18 months. So everything is new, and I'm really trying to soak up and, and connect dots. And um, last night I went to hear Reggie Jackson, um, who is the Gringot for the Holocaust Museum, and his topic was segregation in. Milwaukee. And I'm sitting here and I'm just trying to connect the dots. I don't understand how these roads, how you spoke very eloquently about the connection between Martin Luther King and the labor movement. I'm just not seeing where the race issue fits into um, the second part of your, your presentation. So can you circle back? Well, I mean, unfortunately, not every union was embracing of in being inclusivity. And there was a lot of racism in the labor movement as well, which, and African Americans have obviously struggled under white supremacy since the founding of the country. So it's always been more difficult. I think what my book tries to argue is that despite its problems, the labor movement was one of the few and only um, examples of an ability uh, to forge transracial solidarity. One reason you don't have it so much now is because there's very few unions, very few union members. And it also elevated the living standards of African Americans more than any single group. So I don't think, I don't know if it's possible to ever get rid of racism or segregation, but I do think like, the labor movement helped ameliorate those problems. When it came into focus in the late 60s when King, he was tragically assassinated and so he was not able to continue that journey. And then the labor movement itself declined very rapidly a few years after with deindustrialization. So there wasn't enough opportunity to fulfill this promise. But yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think, um, it's a way that mitigates. And just in Lordstown the other day, I mean, you'll see the most, it's one of the few places is at a union meeting where you'll see honest, like real intermingling between people of different races because the workplace defines them. It's just that there's so few, few of those types of jobs anymore, so. Thank you. Um, I wondered if you could speak to the, um, the the transfer of money from public entities uh, at the state level, like state parks, have been 100% defunded in Wisconsin. Um, and then even, even, locally, that, yeah. even locally, even um, we, locally, we, we have greatly defunded our parks and other public infrastructure, but we have funded and transferred that funding to arenas, stadiums, and other entities that are privately owned, as well as to or, um, corporations like Foxconn. So the, the once progressive ideal of, of having all of these public uh, amenities is, is rapidly uh, vanishing. What I, I think, yeah, and it's been going on for some time, and it's really disturbing. 
And I think that also is another form of like societal cohesion, like public investment parks. And that you saw that in those, in those quotes from the Milwaukee Socialists. Like, and they definitely they weren't perfect. There was a lot of racism in that movement too. But there was, it led to better things for the majority. And that spirit was squashed, not just with Walker, but it really was, I mean, there's quotes from like Paul Ryan. He wants, he told Glenn Beck, I want to uproot Wisconsin progressivism to its core because he saw it as like, I mean, you can look at it two ways, this libertarian ethos. Like, either it's an honest philosophy or it's a cloak for greed. But either way, the public is suffering. But to Ryan, it was like enslaving people, like, you know, social insurance programs and so on. And, um, and he, you know, his, his hero is... Yeah, right. So anyway, I think this transfer uh, to the private sector is, is, is really disturbing. And the university system has been, I mean, there's a co-funded economist at the UW now um, that wrote a really admiring um, you know, piece about how Foxconn was this amazing investment. It's, it's a circular thing, you know. Yeah. In terms of um, what we can expect in the 2020 iteration of Divide and Conquer, do you have any thoughts on changes to the game plan, new things coming in from other states they haven't tried yet here? <laughs> <laughs> no, they've tried it all. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, Trump is going to continue doing that and uh, the wall and so on. Um, I think it will be a continuation. It's The question will be more like, will the other side have a universalist enough message to rally enough people to overcome them. I, I, I don't know the answer. It's being, I think, fought out now on that side. Um, but um, I do think, you know, um, a broad, I mean, look at the most successful Democrat of the 20th century, Franklin Roosevelt. And there were, I mean, there were a lot of problems, but there were a lot of universalist programs, and those things tend to be much more politically um, salient and, and have resonance with people. And I think, you know, that, that type of thing could, could be an effective counterweight to it. If, if it's a tepid message, I think, you know, Trump has a very good chance of winning. So. I was under the impression that Hathaway shirts was the only really good, truly good corporate citizen in this country ever. And last week, the Shepherd Express had Potawatomi Bingo as Milwaukee's finest corporate citizen. And I wonder what you think about that. Uh, I will need to study that issue a little bit more thoroughly before I can comment. Um, I know that there's a really good spice company in Milwaukee, in Pansies. Uh, so there might be three good corporate citizens. No, there's, I mean, I, I don't know enough to say, ma'am. I'm sorry. So. Yes. In your research, um, I get the feeling like, like our politicians at this point are, are kind of smirking at checkmate. You know, they're, they're feeling that they're one step away from this, and that's why they're overt with what they're doing now, replacing corporate people where they used to put a shill in place. Now they just put the boss in place, right? Um, in your research, uh, uh, kind of going off of the, my friend over here, um, an Achilles heel, are you, are you seeing a reveal somewhere? I mean, as media consolidates and as Trump is saying, you know, we need to have our own corporate media, notwithstanding that they have Fox News already, yeah. but, I but you know, they're gonna yeah. own the message. So in the research that you've done and in the past that you've seen it, do you see a, an Achilles heel that's possible? Because they'll be able to manufacture a message for any decline that happens in their base. You know, they'll make a narrative that, that they can buy into. Yeah, well, I mean, there was a Democratic state senator that once told me the Republicans always overreach. But I didn't really believe that, and I, and I wonder about it. One of the things that I thought was an Achilles heel was like Social Security or Medicare, but Trump has managed to chip away at those pretty significantly. And um, I, 
again, it's a lot of what's happening is in a vacuum because there isn't a strong counter message, a lot of fixation um, with issues that I think are more peripheral than the main one, which is the betrayal of the working class, which he is propagating, even though he claims to be doing the opposite. But nobody is really calling him all the time on that. And until they do, he won't suffer any consequences. The Russia thing, whatever one thinks of it, and I don't know enough to be definitive, but I don't think it was politically very useful. Yeah. Um, I just want to thank you for coming tonight. And um, I'm speaking on behalf of being one of the, I was a candidate uh, this past cycle in 2018, ran for state assembly along with my friend Liz. Um, and we ran, I ran in a, thanks. <laughs> Um, and I ran in a tough district. Uh, I had the Wow counties um, on top of Milwaukee. And so it was rural. Um, and being a woman of color uh, was really tough. Um, I had a lot of asking of where did she come from um, and that kind of thing. And so, you know, I was happy with how I did. I got 46% considering it was a very tough district. Um, and I think what we need to keep in mind is that we need people like us taking this sacrifice because we were the reason why Tony pulled this win. Um, I pulled 15,000 votes in my district, she pulled 17, and uh, one of our friends north in Cedarburg, which is even more rural, uh, she pulled 10. And so with those 45,000 votes, he got that extra push to get. Um, and, and I'm gonna do it again in 2020 because, um, yeah. Uh, because I'm a better candidate than my representative. Um, I served in the military. I am an educator. I'm a nurse practitioner. Um, I joined the military after 9-11. And, you know, speaking with over 11,000 households last cycle, you know, I, we made good connections. And I think we have to understand that we need to keep fighting at the basic level. Local government matters, and hopefully that will help our presidential candidate come 2020. So, so thank you for coming to speak to us, because I think we, after last week's election, that was a rough loss, and we need to like pick ourselves up again and, and get ready for 2020. Well, yeah, just to comment, I think that, that point really echoes what Bob LaFollette was talking about, like, and the Republicans do very well. They contest everything, and if you lose, you lose. But as you say, like it, it uh, generated the, the gains we're seeing in other areas. It's like democracy is requires activity, and like just passivity will the others. You know, they they really are very relentless, and and will um, continue to be so. And you saw that in the state senate. I mean, state supreme court race. I think too. Is, You know, you were talking about Achilles' heels, Republicans. I think one of the strategies that I've observed is that they, they don't, you can't cut programs head on. So what they do when they have a surplus, they cut taxes. And then when there's a deficit next year, they've got to cut programs because there's, there's a deficit. I think they did it in Wisconsin, and they're trying to do it now with their Evers. And also, I think they did it on the federal with the recent tax cut they passed. We're going to hit a deficit, and they're going to say, we've got to cut Social Security, we've got to cut this, we have to cut that. They kind of back their way into it, and people don't see what they're doing. By, by short yeah. funding the tax bill was an incredible giveaway to the wealth. And also another example of Trump's betrayal of the working class. They're included in their provision. Their tax rates now go down for building a factory in Mexico. So, I mean, it's, it's an unbelievable bill that will go down in history as one of the worst in, in the recent decades. So, yeah. process of your um, research, um, you looked upon the business plot of 1933, the Smedley Butler um, thing where the, where the industrialists wanted to overthrow um, FDR and, and Yeah, a little bit. And I get, that, that's a little bit in my book, more the, the John Birch Society founding and, and like William Greedy and these people. Um, but yeah, it doesn't play exactly, but the, those industrialists, a part of it does get into my book. There's a lot of, there's a whole class of people that never accepted the New Deal. And they have been railing against it 
there was an illusion that it was accepted. And the reason, and people cite this Eisenhower letter to his brother, but the reason he had to write that letter is because a lot of his friends didn't accept the New Deal. And uh, it was accepted for a time after the Second World War, but they were always working against it. Right to Work was a good example of that. That committee and the, the Birch Society and all of these groups, and then you had the Powell Memo in 1971. There was always, and it's a, it's a question that will never be answered. Is it like an ideological belief in freedom, or is it just a cloak for greed? I don't know, but they have always been hostile to redistributing any kind of wealth. So. The, the only reason that I, I say it is that it, it, it appears to me that Trump is, is Smedley Butler 2.0. You know, where, where Butler said, this is a, a racket, and, and tried to, to you know, right. tell everybody. Trump said, thank you very much, I'll do whatever you say, and continues to. So in some ways, looking at, at the DuPont and the rest of the people that were trying to march out that business plot first, um, the, the, the strategy and plan is, is, is what they're doing right now, only they've just got better technology to do it. Yeah. Well, thank you all. It's been a pleasure. And uh, if anyone wants to, I'll be happy to sign a book if you want to come over and say hi or whatever. So thanks again. <laughs>